Hello and welcome everyone to our next episode of The Graft, this time with Dr. Sanam Logavi, Assistant Professor of the Department of Hematopathology in the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, Houston, Texas, USA. She talks to us about her background, career, influences, and general incredible passion for all things pathology. And she has really that incredible passion. And now enjoy this conversation with Dr. Sanam Logavi. Maybe we just start off um, by hearing about what your background is, uh, where you trained, uh, maybe what influenced you the most, and yeah, how you basically ended up where you are today as an prof um, associate professor in hematopathology in Houston at the MD Anderson. Sure, happy to. I, I have to. I have to start by saying a lot of it has just been accident, happy accidents, <laughs> but. Um, You know, I'm originally from Iran, so I uh, I grew up in Iran and I went to medical school in Iran. Uh, and then I came to the U.S., spent a year in a research lab in Eugene Butcher's laboratory. He's an immunologist at Stanford. Uh, and then from there, I went to do an APCP residency in pathology. And for those of you know your audience that are not familiar with pathology, so pathology in the U.S. is divided into anatomic pathology and clinical pathology, which is AP and CP. So AP is what you mostly do with the microscope, looking at tissue under the microscope. And then CP are disciplines like blood banking, um, you know, hematology, not hematopathology, but hematology, um, chemistry, microbiology. Those are all under the big umbrella of CP. So I did um, residency in APCP at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles, in California. And then I came to MD Anderson and did fellowships in surgical pathology, hematopathology, and molecular pathology. And then I stayed on uh, staff. I've been on staff since 2015, um, I guess for about six years now. Great. Um, what is it about pathology in particular that interests you? What, what was it specifically? Um, that made you want to go into pathology as a specialty? Yeah. So there are several factors. I think, um, you know, the most important is uh, before I actually, you know, came here and before I started applying for residency, I, my best friend's father was a pathologist. And, you know, I had seen in Iran though, which is completely different from, you know, the way we do pathology here. So I'm not sure that that you know, that was the best, the best decision to make the decision based on seeing his practice. Uh, but essentially, that's what influenced me first. And then when I was doing the, um, my research year in Eugene Butcher's laboratory, he was in the Department of Pathology. So I got to rotate with the various uh, pathologists, and I would sit in on their sign outs. Um, and I essentially, you know, I thought this is this is really fascinating. I, you know, I get to see what's going on um, kind of behind the scenes. Um, it's really not something I was, um, you know, I was aware of because pathology is really underrepresented in medical school. You know, you don't really get a lot of exposure. Uh, and it's, it's a really good, um, you know, junction between clinical medicine and research, right? You get to do a lot of research. You get to help clinicians, um, you know, with their research, clinical trials. And even if you want like a full on science career, you could easily do that in, uh, you know, with pathology. So it gives you a lot of options and a lot of leeway in terms of having a flexible career that you can sort of design for yourself. And like Nico and I were discussing in, when trying to prepare for this and we were saying how interesting it is, how different pathology training is in different parts of the world, for example, here in the UK. So in order to become a hematologist, I have to get my FRC path exams. And that involves a quite a significant component of having to actually do pathology, have to sit down and like look at cells under the microscope and, and know what they mean and things. Whereas I think in Germany's, Nico, is it? Do you no, have any of that? We, we, we can have some pathology training if we want to, but basically we're like dependent upon the self-interest we have, whether we are interested to do that, we are not paid for it. And in Germany, it's, it's completely uh, divided into hematologists and pathologists who do hematopathology. And um, that's quite frustrating because you always feel you're quite out of the box and just are dependent upon someone who knows the stuff and you're just 
yeah, interpreting it. Thanks. What are your thoughts on, on that? Do you kind of think that people who are working, looking after patients with uh, hematological malignancies and other hematological conditions that, that they really should have a grounding in pathology to understand or? I think understanding it is very important. And I think understanding the limitations of what we do is very important. I don't, you know, it really depends on your practice setting. I can tell you that, you know, in, in our practice setting, which is a huge, you know, practice with, um, I don't know, like close to 20,000 bone marrows a year, um, it's impossible for our clinicians to, you know, run their clinics and then also look at, you know, the, the pathology slides. It's just not practical. Uh, but they all have a very good understanding of what we do, you know, the, the limitations of what we do, the implications of uh, what we do. And, the, you know, what Nico was saying is very similar to what we have here. Pathology is almost an elective for most, you know, most medical students at, at, as, you know, as they start doing their clinical rotations. It's, it's more heavily represented in like the basic, um, you know, the, the basic science curriculum. Uh, but when they do their, their uh, rotations, it's really an elective. And then the same with the HEMONC fellows, you know, and I guess it's a little bit variable depending on the programs that they're in. But, you know, I can tell you from our own fellows, there are some that are highly interested and they, you know, they approach me, they email me, they say, you know, we want to come sit with you for a day, look at slides, or, you know, we have, we're taking our boards. Can we come and review some, you know, common cases that may be uh, questioned on the boards? But if they don't want to, they can get through their training without looking at a single slide. So, um, you know, it really depends on their, what Nico was saying, like their self-interest. But let me, let me uh, follow up on this to maybe uh, find this uh, in between of what we are discussing, because I, I wrote one sentence uh, from you, I think it was six hours ago, where you just ended up um, with a case and then said, um what does this tumor want me to uh what does it say to me what oh, yeah, does the tumor yeah, I, what tells me and i think that's that's what bugs me the most so there is a fascination with pathology for people who are not into it who doesn't who do not work with it and obviously the hemat hematology field is constantly um yeah into this so you if you read a paper you 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 read pathology but you have no clue what what it is about what what kind of work uh lies behind that so what do you think what 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 is it that we can learn them from pathology and what is the fascination about it that we all somehow feel you know i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna come back to your question but i'll start with three little tidbits is I saw a thing on uh, on Twitter the other day. You know, you know this thing Wordle going on. Everybody's posting their Wordles or whatever. So I, I mean, I, I don't do that. So, but what? But I know what it is. And then I saw someone had posted. You know, this is not a Wordle. It's just like the pathology slide that the pathologist showed at tumor boards. And I, I started thinking. You know, this is very true. We can go and you know show some slides. And obviously everybody's respectful, everybody's trying to pay attention, but a lot of the times it's really difficult for them to, 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 you know, to actually follow what we're saying because it's like a completely foreign language. And I think, I think one of the problems with, you know, us not being able to engage medical students at an earlier stage is that it's very difficult to grasp the concepts early on and it really takes you almost two to three years to start to, to, you know, even understand what's going on on these slides. You know, it's very difficult. It's, it's, it's not a very, I guess, tangible, you know, topic. Um, and I think that's, you know, that turns people off early on and it, it, you know, they lose interest. But I think once you start actually getting the concepts, it becomes very, very fascinating and the other thing I want to mention, so among the three things, one is, you know, still to this day, if you look at publications or pictures of scientists, or there's always a microscope, right? Yeah. There's always a microscope. There's always like a picture. You look at like the modern publications in blood. Usually the, you know, the, the front page of the, the cover is like a pathology slide. It's like a fish picture. It's all of it. So you really can't practice medicine without pathology, for sure. You can't practice oncology without pathology, right? So I think 
part of the fascination is it being so integral to the, you know, to the to patient care, but it's all going on in the background and it's elusive. So I think we just need to do a better job at making a making it a little bit easier for people to understand early on. Um, and I don't know that I have the best solution for that, but I mean, I'm certainly trying with, you know, trying to post these things on Twitter. And I think some of it is, you know, with repetition, it becomes easier for the students and for the trainees to understand and follow. And with all the, the way the world is changing, I mean, with the pandemic, like virtual, um, everything has become a thing. And um, I don't know whether it's the same in the States, but with pathology and as um, technologies are evolving and how and molecular genetics and everything is becoming more complicated and the techniques are getting um, more and more specialized. A lot of services are becoming more centralized so that they're taking place in the big centers with access to everything. Do you worry in the long term that that's going to mean that fewer and fewer trainees actually get that direct exposure to pathology and therefore are less likely to explore it as a as a discipline to pursue their career in? I do, you know, in a way it's like it's, you know, pathology is going corporate as well, right? So yes, I do, but it's it's still not the same in the US. I think, you know, even though we have obviously organizations, you know, I don't want to name names, but big private organizations um, that do pathology, I still think uh, academic medical centers and, you know, hospitals associated with medical schools have pretty decent pathology training and they still have the numbers to support the trainees, you know, the specimen numbers to support their trainees. Uh, but I, but yeah, I, you know, I do worry about that um, because, you know, it's, to me, it's only exposure that, that can ignite that interest. If you're not exposed to it, you just, you know, there's no way you can be interested in it because it's, again, it's so difficult to digest in the beginning. And for you personally, what, when you look back, when you started the training and now with all the developments who, who came out, what, what for you personally changed the most in your experience? What is the thing you, that you notice you do now that you couldn't have done maybe at the beginning of your training? Oh gosh, all of it, <laughs> all of it. Um, you know, I think it's really important to, you know, if, if there are any pathology trainees out there listening to this, I think it's really important to work on the fundamentals first Because if you try to, you know, right now, practicing pathology is completely different than when it was what it was 20 years ago. Right now, as a hematopathologist, I have to be, uh, you know, really proficient at good at analyzing flow cytometry data, at interpreting molecular data. In addition to, so only being a good morphologist is not good enough anymore, right? You have to, uh, you have to kind of incorporate a lot of information into your decision making and into your thought process before you can actually help a patient, right? So right now, me just looking at a slide and saying this patient has acute leukemia is certainly not enough. Not, I mean, it's not nearly enough for anyone to make any therapeutic decisions. So I think that, that can be very overwhelming in the beginning. And my personal uh, you know, solution for that uh, has been to subspecialize, right? So I'm heavily subspecialized in one area. So my area of you know, practice is very, very narrow. And it's easy to become good at something when you're super subspecialized because you're seeing that every day in and out. It's like, you know, it's like a surgeon who only does whipples as opposed to the general surgeon who, you know, does appendectomies and does whipples. And, you know, it's easier to become very good at a very narrow subject. But for some people, they, you know, they don't like to limit their practice to one area and they want to remain more general. And that's also something you can do, at least in the US still in pathology, but that's more like the pra private practice model, right? Where you get to see all sorts of things, but at the same time, you know, your, your practice is not as granular as the subspecialty, uh, you know, subspecialty based uh, practices. But then you can always send consults. You know, you can say this case is too complicated. 
I'm going to send it out to a specialist uh, for a consult. Uh, just another follow-up question on that uh, just came into my mind because you maybe you you already answered it with the subspecializations. But if I have a patient now with AML as a trainee, and I read a lot of molecular information, you said. Um, but I'm confronted with diagnosing this patient and um, sending uh, one specimen of bone marrow to the pathologist. But all in my personal experience, I, I find an overwhelming, um, let's say, information on this molecular thing, on the new technologies, next generation sequencing, this whole thing. And then I need to integrate that. And I'm, that's what I like struggle with to say okay where do i need to focus myself uh do, do you do you all also experience that or do you what's your thought on that you know again i think being at a you know at a center like ours and being super sub specialized it makes it a little bit easier because you know we're dealing essentially with the same entities and it's you know i i read all of the literature on hematologic malignancies but then You know, if, if you put a breast cancer um, slide in front of me right now, I could tell you that it's breast cancer, but I don't know how to fully work it up, you know, anymore. It's because I just don't do that anymore. So I think, um, I, I think my recommendation to the trainees would be to first start with the standardized guidelines, right? So let's say read the NCCN guidelines, you know, the, the, obviously the summarized versions and pertinent versions if you're in the, if you're in the um, US or ELN guidelines. And that gives you an idea of what's important, what are the important molecular markers that you definitely want to know about, you know, what is prognostic, what is predictive, what do you need to know before you make a treatment decision for the patient. And then also, you know, for me, Twitter is a great source of information because it keeps you up to date, right? You see, right nowadays, everybody does tutorials on their publications. Even the most com uh, complicated papers have usually a summarized tutorial by their first author, by the senior author. So you get to get, you know, some of that information kind of indirectly. Uh, but I think start with the fundamentals and start with the established guidelines and then take it from there. You know, you don't need to know all the molecular markers. Um, that comes with time. Now for any hematology trainees who might be interested in thinking about uh, developing an interest in pathology, do you have any particular advice or any particular resources that you direct them to? Oh, so it's interesting that you asked that because I have maybe good news for you. So um, we have, um, I think this is the first time we're publicly talking about it, but I hope that it's okay with the other, the other co-founders. So we now have two ongoing efforts. One is, um, do you guys know Kamran Mirza? He's also very mm -hmm. active. He's a hematopathologist on Twitter. Uh, so Kamran and I are um, teaming up with a few of our clinicians here and Anand Patel at, uh, in Chicago. And we're doing um, a, um, you know, it's a project, it's called the Heme Reports. So this is going to be purely focused for hematology trainees. It'll kind of be like morning reports, but for hematology trainees, it'll be case-based discussions uh, that incorporate clinical hematology with pathology. And I think it'll be really good to get just like an overall grasp of how pathology is used uh, for, you know, for, for therapeutic decisions, for just like your day-to-day -day practice. And then the other effort is actually with, um, with a couple of current trainees who are soon to be assistant professors. So one is Curtis, he's uh, Curtis Echoist, he's our leukemia fellow right now. Uh, so this is a project and it's called House of Heme. So this is going to be purely focused on training clinical hematologists in pathology. So we're going to do intro introductory lectures. We're going to have um, slides. We're going to have kind of like puzzles, journal clubs, um, and, you know, things that make learning pathology a little bit more fun for the non-pathologist. Uh, and I really hope that these are going to be, you know, um, educational resources that hematology trainees can use uh, to, to, you know, kind of educate themselves a little bit better in pathology. Are these free to access? Ah, absolutely. Everyone? Yeah. 
They're gonna oh, be nice. Really, so you Perfect. know, we're gonna make announcements on uh, on Twitter, and I'll make sure to tag you guys so you know. But um, yeah, they're gonna be free, and they're gonna be you know, it's essentially the the aim is just to like um, educate clinical hematology trainees in in pathology. Mm -hmm. When when you talk about the opportunities um, today of like virtual opportunities to educate yourself, etc. But um, what did you influence the most in your training? You, you said the pathology decision was influenced by father, friend, but what uh, you, over your career, what, what do you think what had the most, uh, the biggest influence on your decision making? I think my mentors, um, you know, I think it sounds a little cliche, but I think it's true. You know, I've tended to gravitate towards people that I admire, you know, I wanted to be like them. So I, I kind of tried to, you know, take away the things from them that I thought, you know, I could, I could use to progress in my career. And I think, uh, you know, there are several people that uh, have been instrumental in, in my career development. Uh, one is my chair, uh, Dr. Jeff Medeiros, he's a lymphoma pathologist. Uh, he's been instrumental Uh, Joe Curry, um, you know, Sa Wong, uh, these are hematopathologists at MD Anderson um, that like, completely um, have revolutionized the way I think about pathology. And, you know, the way they, they teach pathology has inspired me um, throughout my career. And I think, you know, one of, the, one of the things that maybe I would, you know, this is, again, more for pathology trainees than for... Um, hematology trainees but i think you know sometimes it's it's easy to become completely dissociated from what's going on in the clinic and what's going on in you know in like the patient facing um areas and i would you know i think one of the things that's helped me in my career a lot has been i've always tried to be in very close communications with the clinicians here and i think it's really helped me both in my career and in um you know like in my professional growth And in becoming a better pathologist. So that's one thing that I would, you know, highly encourage. And where do you see yourself, let's say, in the next 10 years? Oh, wow. That's a hard question. Um, honestly, I don't know, but I... Um, I'm not going to answer <laughs> that question. Um, no, I mean, you know, the, I think every academic um, physician uh, wants to make an impact, right? And I think, um, I mean, to me, the most important thing is making an impact, both for patients and for education, because I think, you know, education is super, super important to me. And I think it's kind of like I think of it as a legacy, right? Um, so I hope to, you know, to work on developing these, these efforts, having um, impact on trainees, um, you know, obviously um, developing more leadership skills, uh, maybe having a leadership position. Uh, those are things that I think about and I hope to do. Yeah, but the question, I, I just asked the question, um, I'm sorry if it was too personal, <laughs> but, not, at um, all, not at all. But I think that uh, it's one of the, like, hidden questions every trainee has is uh, should I dare to see myself anywhere because in the meantime anything can happen as you said I can uh, like come into a new mentor that I'm totally fascinated by and I leave the hospital and go someplace else or find maybe a, a, a wife or a husband or friend and I follow them um, so the future is sometimes always this kind of like fork in the career of trainees. In my, my experience, nobody really wants to talk about it. Everybody says, yeah, I'll see where I can go. I'm not I mean, sure. Is, you, can, you can hope and you can certainly plan, but it's, I mean, sometimes there are circumstances that are completely out of your, you know, your control. And sometimes life takes you in different directions. But I think one of the things that I would say is, you know, like be ready for opportunity, mm. be ready to take advantage of opportunities. And uh, I, like to me, watching, you know, seeing so many successful people around me, I think what stands out in the people that are, you know, just extraordinary 
is that they've always, like they're hungry for new opportunities, right? They take on new opportunities and they're not afraid to be challenged. So I think, you know, it's, it's sometimes, you know, saying yes is scary. Taking on responsibility is scary. But I think until you actually do that, um, you know, you never take the next step. You never, you never become a better version of yourself, which is ultimately, you know, the goal in life, right? Is to just become a better version of yourself every day. Uh, but maybe you can um, talk about a bit, or you can talk, or you maybe know about it a bit more. Uh, where you see pathology in 10 years? What do you think will make the most difference in developments? What is may maybe currently going on? We don't know about yet because it's an early phase. The yeah. development, I, I mean, machine learning is a big thing. Everybody doesn't really, maybe doesn't dare talk to. Uh, talk about it, what kind of real influence it will make in the next years? I mean, I think practically speaking, uh, I think machine learning and art artificial intelligence are going to be very impactful in the next 10 years in pathology for sure, because there are, you know, various uh, tedious, but, you know, relatively easy tasks that we do as pathologists that are completely amenable to artificial intelligence. And, you know, like scoring immunohistochemistry slides, uh, like finding organisms on slides, these could easily be done with very simple, you know, AI algorithms. And I think a lot of what we do is going to be done by, I don't think, you know, with, with the regulations and like licensing and everything, I don't think pathology is going to die as a specialty. I think the way we practice is going to be very different, just like it's different now compared to 20 years ago. So I think we're going to be using um, artificial intelligence to improve our practice uh, and hopefully, you know, focus on more difficult tasks uh, with with like the human brain uh, and um, delegate some of the more tedious but easy tasks to artificial intelligence. But I also think that, you know, that's that's one thing. Uh, but I also think that artificial intelligence is going to be instrumental in um, in, you know, oncology for sure, because, uh, you know, if you think about it now, the way we classify diseases still and to this day, you know, I don't know if you guys saw or not, but there's like three publications out in the past month talking about blast counts in, in defining leukemia. Right. Uh, whereas you really want to be focusing on genetics, on patient characteristics, on, you know, other uh, intrinsic tumor characteristics to define a disease. And so I think, you know, applying what we've learned in terms of genomics in the past 20 years to disease classification and the way we think about disease biology is going to change the practice of pathology in the next 10 years for sure. And then a last question, because you said we um, maybe the goal should be uh, to train hard and to get better. I have a question for myself um, because I experienced it in, in my first days in, in clinical care. Maybe Claire also had the same experience when I sent my first um, bone marrow specimen to pathologists and I uh, received that quite back um, with a um, Yeah, the question was too vague. What what should I look for? What what do you want me to tell? Uh, what do you tell me? Um, what what would be? Do you also have that experience where you're quite angry that uh, people just <laughs> sent sent you something and somehow like yeah, please do that for me and I can go well, on with my life. <laughs> it depends. I think again, being you know at at the place that I am, we're very privileged because we, you know, we have access to the patient's medical charts. We know exactly what's going on. There's detailed notes in the chart. So I never have that issue where I get a specimen and I don't know what to do with it because the question is always clear. The clinicians have very detailed notes, but I can see that if you work, you know, at a reference lab, it, it, it can be very difficult to practice pathology without appropriate clinical history, right? Um, so I would say try and provide as much useful information to your pathologist because, and, you know, I don't mean this in a um, disrespectful way, but this is something I learned in, in my pathology training is the phraseology garbage in, garbage out. 
So if you don't give that, you know, if you don't give good information, you're not going to get good information. Uh, and this doesn't, you know, some, some diseases are very obvious. You know, I don't need clinical information to diagnose a CLL. But, you know, let's say if you're looking for hemophagocytosis, like tell me that you're looking for hemophagocytosis, something like that, right? So that I think is important. Uh, but I also think that, you know, uh, you as a clinician also get better with time, right? So you know, you learn what are the questions that you should be asking your pathologist. Like when, when should you actually pick up the phone and talk about this patient with your pathologist as opposed to like a very straightforward case for them where, you know, you really don't need to discuss much. Um, so that, that becomes easier with time too. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things that you mentioned is, you know, becoming better with, with training. I think it's important to realize that as, as physicians, even with, you know, even when you're a full professor, you're kind of still in training, you're still learning every day. And that's, that's actually what I love the most about working at an academic center like this is I I literally learn something new every day just by seeing these difficult cases, by being around people that know more than I do. And, you know, I, I think I've mentioned this before, but I'm going to say it because it's true. Sometimes I don't believe that they pay me to do what I do because I love it so much. You know, I, I, I look at these slides and I'm so fascinated by it. Sometimes I don't, you know, I, I don't even like I lose track of time. I'm just sitting in my office looking at these slides and I'm just like constantly fascinated by what I'm seeing and what's going on. Like the PD-1 case that I posted today, I was actually looking at, you know, historical samples from this patient uh, to, to, you know, take pictures for a case submission. And then I looked at the PD-1 stains and I said, huh, isn't that interesting? Like what is going on with this patient? I've never seen this before. This is something new to me. So I would say, you know, just think of it as lifelong learning and, you know, I think we're in a privileged situation where we just get to learn new things every day. How many people can say that? Yeah, and I think going back to what you said, often it's like with pathology, it's sometimes the the fear of the unknown. I know, for like for myself, the thought of having to sit in a lab and and look at blood films it made me question whether I whether I actually did want to go into hematology here in the UK, where we have to do that. Wow. Actually. Once you get into it and once you start to like really appreciate and be able to do it, now there's nothing I enjoy more than being able to like see the patient and then being able to be like, oh, oh, that can't be something I'm worried about. I'll just go and have a little look or like speak oh, to someone right. who's who's had a look. And I think the enthusiasm you have for the specialty is incredible. And this yeah. has been yeah, a really, really great discussion. And um thank you for giving us your time today and oh of course my pleasure i really enjoyed talking to you both For and sure. if we if we can share your heme reports and house of heme and we we will definitely do that just oh, absolutely. send it across yeah. if we go live i'm definitely gonna let you know and uh, yeah Perfect. sure that would be great oh, brilliant and yeah we definitely look forward to seeing them for sure thank you thank you so much you both this was lovely thank you have a good day See you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.